Well, it's that time again. This is Dev Central Connects. I'm John Wagnon, joined by the man, the myth, the legend, Jason Rom. It's good to see you here, man. You too, man. Fantastic. It's uh, it's always good to be at the Dev Central Connects live stream where we connect with you, our community. And as always, we are streaming live to YouTube and LinkedIn and Periscope and uh, and we'll interact with you guys. And so I can already see uh, Pytil. Uh, you, <laughs> you like the soundtrack from that last one. You know, we've been kind of testing things out a little bit. You know, it's like, hey, what intro do we use? What music do we use? Um, but this, you like the intro here better. The two minute warning. Yeah, uh, our, our uh, creative studio team helped us out with this a lot and uh, put some creative little uh, little nuggets in there. Like, hey, and, you know, last chance for a break or whatever. So it's, yeah, the, uh, it's a lot of The two minute warning is kind of a misnomer, though, because like the the entire rest of the half of the football game <laughs> takes Goodness. less time than the last two minutes. Yeah, the last two minutes yeah. takes, you know, an hour and a half or whatever. Yep. It's crazy. So. So yeah, man, it's Phoenix. Uh, Hello. Phoenix bites. Phoenix rises from the ashes. The Phoenix does, <laughs> and Phoenix also bites. But it's good to it's good to see you, Phoenix bites. Yep. Daryl awesome. Boo. Hello. Yeah, didn't mean to make the count of timer so similar. That's awesome. Hey, man, if it works, it works, right? If it's that's good right. stuff, it's good stuff. So uh, yeah, no, it's that's great things. It's great things. And Hugo, Hugo, how are you doing? Welcome, Hugo. It's an excellent day. It's always an excellent day here on Dev Central Connects, right? So that's right. All right, so Jason, to start this show, I have a question for you, and I want you to confess to the entire audience out there and everyone that will watch this in the future because it will be on YouTube and LinkedIn for all of eternity. Wow. Okay. Um, so no if you if you were forced to get up on stage and sing a karaoke song, or maybe you're not forced, maybe you enjoy doing that. What song? What was? What's your go-to karaoke song? Wow. That is a tough one because, or maybe, I, maybe, I don't maybe really you've got do a couple. Karaoke because you know I, I've got the I've got a voice that fits real nice in the choir. Okay, um, yeah. But I did get up on stage and sing "Love of a Lifetime" by Firehouse of uh, to my girlfriend at the time, <laughs> but who's now my wife. And in fact, today is our 26 year anniversary. Wow, so, it sounds like that worked. So yeah, it Goodness. worked out. So that is that is in fact the love of a lifetime. Yeah, that's awesome, so, man. Yeah, that is awesome. So, love of a lifetime is probably you know uh, I don't know that would be my go to karaoke song. Yeah. I do like uh, uh, what's the one we do in rock band all the time? What's well, the one I sing a lot? I was gonna um, say um, you sing you sing some Little Miss can't can't be wrong. Little Miss can't be wrong, um, uh, which is very fast in some places. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, that's good. That's yeah. good. Uh, and, we, and you, what, what, <laughs> what is your go-to song? So I, I have to say people don't normally have to drag me up to sing karaoke. I love some karaoke, but I either go with some Huey Lewis in the news, the power of love, you know, way to go back to the future. Um, or I will, I will try to hit those falsetto notes and go Bonnie Tyler's totally clip to the heart. <laughs> it's always a, a crowd favorite, or at least I think it's a crowd favorite when I sing it and I just don't pay attention to what everyone else says or does right so it's yeah. uh it's good stuff <laughs> that's awesome yeah so uh so i know you were talking about the uh the choir voice that made me think of someone that was like john you need to sing a solo <laughs> you need to sing so low that no one else can hear you right now so yes, uh below the yeah. human audible uh, why, why don't you go up in the choir get in the very back away from the <laughs> microphones kind of a thing you know so it's, oh, uh, it's good stuff it's good stuff awesome man well, hey, uh, yeah, we've got some more got some more stuff coming in, man. Uh, Anad Biram. Hey, Jason and John. And we say that right back to you. Hey, right back. Yeah. Hey, right back, Anad. It's good to see you out there. Great to uh, great to connect with everybody. Thank you, Leslie um, and Priscilla, for the yeah. anniversary. Uh, yeah, happy Christmas. anniversary to, uh, to, to Jason and his bride, who he's saying love of a lifetime to. Hopefully, uh, hopefully you didn't sing that too many times. Sounds like it's a sounds like it's a winner and you just boom. Yeah, it can't. You can't not get married after that one. You know. Yep. Now we've so, sung it in the house, or you know, around the house occasionally, yeah. and you know, just to uh, you know horrify our children. <laughs> and so <laughs> you get married all over again. That's you right. know, it's like I, I can't, right. I can't not continue on with the with the wedding at that point. Yep. Good stuff, man. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. So karaoke, it's uh, it's a lot of fun to get out there and do that. Well, hey, so we've got some amazing content today. Um, we've got a special guest from our Silverline SOC team. And just, just for those that have not heard of the Silverline SOC team, these guys are amazing. The Silverline SOC, it's the Security Operations Center. 
They are standing by doing amazing work 24-7, 365. They never take a day off. Uh, and these are the, the this is the team that um, looks at all the attacks that come through for all of our Silverline customers. So if you're in a if you're in the middle of a DDoS attack, then our Silverline team is going to jump in and be like, hey, company X, uh, we see that you're under attack. And in fact, a lot of times they'll just go ahead and take care of it and be like, hey, we've got you covered. Uh, but over the course of time, you can imagine that these Silverline SOC analysts are going to say, hey, we see all these different types of DDoS attacks and we see these different trends that start to happen. And we see how big these things are, or how small some of them are, or what are the uh, attack vectors that are used by these different attackers. And uh, so then they start to learn, you know, they're like, hey, I've, got, I've gotten really, really good at what a DDoS attack looks like and how to mitigate it and how to help protect all of our customers. So anyway, so from that team today, we have the one and only Mr. Edgar Ojeda, and uh, he is a superstar on our SOC. He's a security, uh, senior security support engineer uh, that just lives and breathes this stuff, man. You eat DDoS attacks for snacks, right, Edgar? You just- you, I have my breakfast every morning. <laughs> that's right, that's right. You have, your, you have your cereal, you know, and your milk, and then you take yep. a little snack of a, you know, of a UDP flood, right? Yep. So that's pretty much. That's, that's what awesome. keeps me healthy. <laughs> that's awesome, Edgar. Thanks so much for being here today, man. It is our honor that you would join us here on Dev Central Connects today. Totally. Thank you as well. Thank you for having me, guys. And uh, by the way, Jason, happy anniversary! Congrats. Yeah, thank you. Love thank it. You. Love it. So to kick things off real quick, you know, what what does your day to day look like? Um. Well, the day to day, it's a bit busy, like it can start like a little bit, you know, on the well, usually, you know, like since I work also like in the morning, so I start at uh, 6 30 in the morning uh, Pacific time. Usually around that time, in like the US East Coast, so it's already awake. So many times we are already like um, mitigating or working with some customers, troubleshooting issues. So, like, it's usually um, pretty like it starts kind of easy. It ramps up quite fast in the amount of work, and um, and yep, like when, when as soon as I log into my computer, um, the first thing is I pull out my monitors because we have some monitors where we can see all the incoming traffic, and that's how we can identify the DDoS attacks, and that's. Well, that's pretty much uh, like what I stare at the whole day. Like just my monitor <laughs> here, and just making sure that when we see an attack, we can just analyze traffic and mitigate it. That's well, amazing. Let me ask yeah. you a, a, a question. In in your monitors, is green good and red bad? <laughs> Usually, yes. Actually, blue is really good. Green is like yeah, things are kind of getting a little bit out of control. Okay. And, okay. Uh, wow. and from there we go to orange, and and, and then red. Red is okay. usually bad. Okay. Okay. So it's not your traditional stoplight chart, right? It's the blue <laughs> is good, and then wow. you kind of go down from there. Yep. Gotcha. But if you hit red, then that's that's uh, that's not good time, right? That's not good land. Yeah. Good yep. stuff. It's like tur turning a little bit, uh, uh, going a little bit rebel there because blue is typically like the notification or informational or right or whatever. Right. Yeah. So yeah, no, that's safe. But you guys, hey, you do what you got to do, man. Right. Whatever it takes to keep these DDoS attacks out of our out of our uh, backyards, you know. So yeah. uh, so good stuff. Well, hey, man, there was there is a uh, there's a report that you guys just put together. In fact, I think you were one of the principal authors of this, or you you certainly helped uh, write it a lot of it, where it analyzes a lot of the current DDoS attacks and, and more specifically what we have seen since the coronavirus craziness that has just engulfed our whole world, right, for the last few months. Yep. And so uh, so I wanted to just kind of walk through that a little bit and let you, let you shed some light on some of the attack trends that you've seen, uh, you know, in the midst of this coronavirus. And, uh, and so maybe, the, maybe one of the first things I would ask you about is these different attack vectors that you guys observe. And, you know, so maybe you could, maybe you could shed some light on, you know, how many different types of attack vectors do you see happen? So like if I'm an attacker over here and I send in, you know, uh, a UDP flood of whatever, and then Jason's another attacker and he sends in a TCP, you know, 
reset flag attack or whatever, then those are two different attack vectors. But yep. they, but you may use that attack vector a hundred or a thousand different times. So, but it, it's it's uh, in the report. You guys talk about different types of attack vectors that you have seen, and maybe the trends of those during the the coronavirus uh, pandemic. So, could you shed a little bit of light on that for us? Yep, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, definitely the, we see multiple attack vectors. Like we we keep track of at least. 12 different vectors that we see on a, on a more common basis. Um, that is um, mostly like TCP attacks, TCP-based attacks, uh, UDP-based attacks, um, reflection attacks. Um, and um, from there, um, well, basically what we saw uh, or what we are seeing lately is also like attackers are using a combination of vectors just, you know, just because, well, when you combine powers, then the attacker increases in size. And it's like a superhero, right? You know, you want more than yep. one, you want more than one superpower, right? Yep. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Okay. So, yep, that is something that we've seen. Like we, we've seen especially uh, amplification factors we've seen like more um, on the rise. Mm-hmm. And uh, and you know like com- combining the vectors is usually how the attackers try to be successful. But well, we are we are or we are way better. So like we mitigate those attacks. But yep, the attackers try. Yeah, no, oh, no doubt about it. That's, I think it's fascinating that uh, <laughs> obviously in a very simple world, an attacker would just say, "Hey, here's my one attack vector." You know, I'm going to send a UDP flood or some kind of DNS amplification or so, just that that one thing, and then you know try to knock down this whatever web server, you know, this web application. But that's not what happens. They tend to use like several of them all at the same time. Isn't that true? Or maybe correct me if I'm wrong. No, that is totally true. And okay. you know, and especially like also one of the things that we see as well is like um, sometimes they will launch an amplification attack. You know, uh, with um, a lot of traffic, uh, high bandwidth, lots of gigs of uh, traffic coming into our scrubbing centers, and then hidden within all that uh, all that traffic, we will see like some uh, low-level TCP attacks as well. Um, and well, because TCP doesn't require to be to be like um, very large in terms of bandwidth, but in terms of packets per second, so um, that TCP TCP attacks can damage a server more than actual uh, amplification attacks. Mm. So uh, that's also why we have to like constantly as well um, mitigate an attack. We see uh, an amplification factor, we mitigate that one, and then we have to just continuously check the traffic that we're sending um, as clean to our customers. Because if we see that we're also like some other attack vector is leaking after the mitigation, then we have to fine tune the, the countermeasures that we're using. Mm. It seems like there's a, a lot of cat and mouse with uh, pretty much. Yeah. yeah, pretty much. It's a constant yeah. chase. You know, who yeah. who's got the upper hand right now kind of deal. Yeah. Yep. yep. Yeah, that's awesome. I noticed I noticed one of the charts in this report shows that the that the number of attack vectors that these attackers are using was actually a little bit less in January this year, January 2020. Way back, if all of you people can remember back to January 2020. <laughs> You know, that's when like I don't, I don't I don't even remember that far back. It feels like ten years ago when we could all still have meals. Yeah, when and I meat. could walk outside, you know, and whatever. Um, yeah. But uh, but but back in 2020, the number of attack vectors was lower. There were a, there were fewer number. There were fewer attack vectors that were being used this year in January than compared to a year ago, like January of 2019. But then as coronavirus crept in, as February and March and April and May and June and all that then the number of attack vectors that we saw started to increase and they became more, you know, th- there were more of them used than there were in those months in 2019. So yeah. is, one, is that, you know, is, is, is that true? And then also, what do you think, like, why do you think people, why do you think that is? I don't know. Well, I mean, um, I think it's, um, I, I mean, from an attacker point of view, like, you know, if if I'm if I were to be an attacker, well, when when is when I can disrupt the most um, of my targets? Well, it's when we all started going remote, right? Like because uh. we like 
all all organizations you know globally like we started depending on like internet without internet we we wouldn't actually be able to continue our operations so i think they attackers of course so that so that weak spot on like yep we attack the internet and then we disrupt the operations of these companies that we are trying to uh, to impact so mm -hmm. It, that, that's why I, I think it's uh, it makes sense that we did see like an increase, uh, a considerable increase on attacks starting like the last the last half of February and all the way until like June. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. Yeah, we got a question uh, from Priscilla. Priscilla, how are you doing today? Uh, can you describe how the scrubbing center itself works? How how do you know how does the traffic go through Silverline? And then reach the customer application. You know, we talk about you know, scrubbing it and and seeing all these amplification attacks. But you know, how do you see that? How, how does this thing work? All right. Um, so in Silverline, we have two different ways um, on how we attract traffic on, onto our scrubbing centers. So um, one of the modes we call it the routed mode. Uh, in this case, you you have to create uh, GRE tunnels um, between our scrubbing centers and and customer routers. And we're going to use those GRE tunnels to send the clean traffic um, after after the mitigations were put in place. Um, via those GRE tunnels as well, uh, the customers uh, announce uh, their prefixes, the prefixes that they want us to protect. They do it via BGP. They use BGP for nothing. And um, and then we announce, we use BGP to re-announce um, to our upstream carriers. We use uh, tier one carriers. Uh, because well, we serve uh, we serve uh, customers globally, so we need to have tier one co uh, carriers. Mm -hmm. um, and um, well, the carriers start advertising, then we become the the preferred path. Um, so that's how we get visibility into our scrolling center. So once the traffic enters our scrolling centers, um, it goes through um, well through our monitoring devices and we have detection devices. If if an attack is that is spotted, then we move traffic onto our mitigation gear, um, only for that specific prefix, so that uh, uh, so that tra uh, traffic or prefixes that are not under attack, mm -hmm. they don't have to go through any sort of mitigation anything. It's only we we will only move to mitigation gear the prefix that is under attack. Um, and well, we apply countermeasures again. And once that the the traffic is clean, then that's when we use the GRE tunnels to deliver the clean traffic. Nice. The second option is um, via proxies. Uh, so uh, we we will assign uh, an a virtual IP uh, to our customers. They can go in the portal. They configure uh, the backend IP, so their origin servers IP. Um, we assign a front end IP that they have to, customers have to point their DNS to that IP that we assign. And uh, well, once DNS propagates globally, uh, when uh, let's say when, let's say f5.com. So when a customer tries to go f5.com, then and per the nature of DNS resolution, it will resolve to the Silverline IP that was assigned. And that's how we would get all those requests and again, like those are processed um, on our scrolling centers, and then we process, um, we send the request to the backend server. And in this case, and um, this this um, this communication doesn't happen uh, through GRE. This happens through the open internet. Uh, the communication between the pro the server and proxy infrastructure and the customer backend servers, uh, and then we get the responses as well via the open internet. Uh, we and then we we forward those those responses to the client that initiated the request. Okay, fantastic. And, and Jason, you did a speaking of BGP back there. What you were just talking about the border gateway protocol, right? You did a, a lightboard lesson on that. So if anyone's like, hey, what's this BGP stuff all about? Although many of you probably know, uh, you can go check out that lightboard. Yeah, I used to be a router jockey back in my day, so um, worked on many an ISP backbone. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Get yeah. the old backbone going. I love it. I love yeah. it. Yeah. We do have another question from Anand. A similar question is the setup of F5 Silverline like other CDN or ISP DDoS products. And I, I, I would say, you know, functionally, uh, that would be true. I mean, they're, they're all going to kind of generally work the same way uh, with, mm -hmm. uh, you know, each vendor bringing in their 
own you know internal infrastructure and mm -hmm. management tools and and mitigation techniques and all that yeah um, but you know you can probably speak more precisely to that yep definitely no and you are actually correct like uh, we would it's kind of like a standard setup for many of uh, the DDoS providers um like we all do pretty much the same we all do GRE tunnels and um, of course you know, like um, some other uh, some other vendors might do um, something different, and as you said, like really the the difference is just on the secret sauce um, on how traffic is processed within our uh, our scrubbing centers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But overall, it's like it's pretty standard. Like you know, um, I mean, I've seen uh, our competitors also use Jerry tunnels. They use proxies, so it's pretty standard in the industry. Yeah. We set up. So the so the real the real differentiator is that secret sauce you're talking about. Like, what do we what do we do? How do we apply our stuff to this traffic to scrub it properly, right? Yep. And is our, does our secret sauce taste better than your secret sauce or whatever, right? So yep, I gotta think our, sec our secret sauce is pretty pretty fantastic here. So right. F one F five several line, and it's got a, amazing ingredients like Edgar. You know, that's bringing right. that mix together. That's right. that's right. We got we got the cooks. Yep. We got the the chefs in there cooking. Exactly. This stuff <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> Good stuff, man. All right. So so on the on this report, you know, we talked about the number of attack vectors, and you mentioned, you know, hey, it, it kind of makes sense. These people they're at home during coronavirus, and now it's like I want to launch an attack, and rather than send one, you know, send one attack at somebody to try to knock them down, let me send. 50 of them or whatever, right? I mean, what's what's the only thing better than one attack vector? 50 attack vectors at the same time, right? Or whatever, right? So, yep. so yeah, so we really saw a spike in the number of vectors used, um, but mm -hmm. I think we also saw a spike in the total bandwidth that was consumed, you know, or that was used up by these different attacks. So maybe yep. you can talk to us about that. Like what kind of spike did we see and and you know how devastating could that be to a to an organization? Well, um, so we did see a few um, a few attacks um, that peaked a little bit over two hundred thirty five gigs, so like eight, mm -hmm. um, or gigabits per second. Um, so and we saw like I mean multiple. So that one, those ones are especially um, dangerous. Because you know, like many many organizations, they don't really need that much bandwidth. Like their their um, their ISPs um, or their contract with their ISPs are like for one one gig of traffic that they are gonna um, use for their regular operations. Maybe at most a ten a ten gig um, pipe. Mm -hmm. That's about it. So imagine trying to feed like two hundred gigs into a tiny one ten one or ten gig. Like I mean, at that point. Yeah. Cost, like that organization would be pretty much like down until they man they are able to um, well mitigate the attack uh, yeah. right off or the attacker or the attackers get get tired right of um, of sending the attack. Um, right. So um, with with us, well, since Silverline, uh, we have um, about uh, four terabits of uh, scrubbing capacity. So that's like twenty times more the the um, the attack. That we saw, or the attacks that we saw during this, uh, this, yeah. this, um, this previous six months. Oh. Um, so that's why we we are we have the capability of absorbing that um, um, absorbing that that attack traffic, yeah. and um, and then mitigate it. And then, well, the customer the, was not disrupted because well, we managed to mitigate the and. Right. Their application just remained operational, and well, we just um, you know we just applied mitigation, and all those all those uh, malicious traffic were just uh, yeah. dropped. That Edgar, that kind of reminds me of when I was in high school. Me and like thirteen of my friends tried to cram into this one car. It was like a little bitty two door <laughs> car, and it just wasn't happening, man. I mean, there's only so much capacity, right? So about half of us were like, hey, we're not getting in that thing or this car's not going to operate because there's four people sitting in the driver's seat or whatever. Right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, similar kind of thing. It's like if you've got a if you've got a 10 gig pipe coming into your organization or like you said, some people may have one gig or, you know, whatever. Right. Then if you get hit with a 
frankly, if you get hit with more than 10 gig, <laughs> you know, DDoS attack, then you're you're going to tip over. I mean, it's it's not going to be good. Yeah. Um, yep. So well, and that that kind of leads to this other question. I'll I'll put up here from uh, Anise here in a second. But was that car a Chevette? <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> was it yes, really? It was. It was a uh, yeah. Not to not to dig down a rabbit hole too much, but I had a Chevrolet Chevette, um, which Ooh. was just. I was happy that the that the engine started when I turned the key. Right. Um, okay. Although I told everyone I was like, "Hey guys, I drive a Vet." You know, and most yeah. people thought I was talking about a Corvette. I was like, no, 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 Chevette. Yeah. Anyway, but the, I yeah, the, the two eighty cars, you know, the Chevette. There's a there's a song by Audio Adrenaline called My Chevette, and it starts the lyrics as like, you know, my my car goes zero to sixty sometimes. sometimes. <laughs> right. So you know, if the I'm Chevette. Lucky. And, yeah. and then the other one is the um, uh, oh, what is the? It's it was the Ford. What was that? That temp was it? The tempo? Uh, What's the? It was in the movie called. Uh, um uh top secret and oh yeah and or was it the pinto pinto thank the you pinto. Yes. yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, the Ford pinto. Okay. so in the movie top <laughs> secret you know the the pinto is in the field yeah and like something just barely bumps and then blows <laughs> it just up explodes like, the car we, the car explodes yeah we yeah. had a yeah not the cow the cow didn't explode yeah. the, the ford pinto exploded but we had a pinto and i i can i can vouch for uh top secrets accuracy <laughs> right in Val the Kilmer, quality of a, the ford pinto the classic um, movie but yeah we digress a bit yeah. so but, but back to what, yeah. uh, you know what's the difference <laughs> between silver silver line ddos mitigation versus ddos on the f5 uh mm -hmm. big ip itself apart from being done at the f5 data center and handled by experts so you know I, i'll lead in and then and then you can take over but the, the lead in there what you already addressed is like one of the big differences is your data the data center scrubbing takes care of the the just the amplification of the bandwidth because yeah. if you don't have the bandwidth to carry the flood coming to you then you know the the ddos on your box isn't going to it can only handle what the pipe in front of it can handle right but I, i'm sure there are other uh differences as well and you know what would you say to anise um so yeah that is one of the largest differentiators right like um and customers sometimes ask us that like hey well but i have a big ip on prem and i have the ddos module enabled why do i need ddos, DDoS from silverline and you you actually said it like perfectly and it's well yeah but again like if you get like a really really large attack uh, with your uh, with a one gig or 10 gig pipe, then it will be it will be it will be overwhelmed because also these attacks like ramp up like in seconds. Like you don't even have time to pick up the phone and email call your uh, your carrier and say like, hey, can you block traffic coming from these IPs? Or you know, like you really don't have time. By the time you are on the phone and you manage to get someone on the phone um, yeah. from your carrier, then you are like, I mean, your application is totally down. Operations are like. Um, Everything is on fire, you know. Like, <laughs> like, know. like you have you have there like maybe the CTO calling the manager of the of the IT team and it's like, why is this uh, not working? So you know, like it becomes a chaos. So, and um, aside from that, yes, we you also have um, the um, benefit of having a, um, a managed service where um, you know, like basically, you just configure your service. And um, if you really don't want to make any changes that often, you just let us know uh, that your configuration is set is the way uh, it works for your uh, for your regular operations, and uh, we will monitor and just mitigate attacks, notify notify per um, well per the instructions that each customer has. Some customers want us to yep, just send me an email. That's fine. Some customers want us to jump into um, a bridge where we discuss our observations. So, I mean, we follow the incident procedures that each customer has. Um, and mm -hmm. that's that's pretty much, that would be, I, I, I guess that would be like the differentiator of the capacity and the, um, the benefit that it's a managed service by um, people. And like, you know, um, like also one of the things that I, want to say is like um also my team like the whole SOC like the all all the guys uh in the SOC are like really 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 smart people like mm -hmm. i'm i feel actually privileged to have the opportunity to work with them as well so yeah, yeah like i yeah. think i yeah. think that's yeah. um 
Yeah, let me let me dig into the just kind of the operational process because I actually don't know the answer to this. But from a from a standpoint of it being a managed service, you know, Anissa's question about you know being handled by experts when when you're on the receiving end of an attack and and it's maybe your first time under attack, you you don't really know exactly what the problem is and how to mitigate it if it's not a bandwidth issue, right? Mm -hmm. But on the managed service side, you guys see all these attacks all the time. And so you guys can quickly identify, okay, this is what's going on and put in a mitigation. Um, and yeah. so, you know, that that breadth of expertise that you guys have, you know, it provides that that quick resolution. But on the operational process side, when, when you see one customer um, attacked in a certain way, what, how, how does it work to be able to share the, the breadth of expertise that you've had with that attack across the customer uh, base? Mm -hmm. Is that something that you guys, so, okay, we're seeing this, we've seen it more than once, we're going to go ahead and, and deploy some policy that protects everyone? Or, or is that like a list of things that, that you notify the customer and say, hey, here's a new suite of things you can apply and we recommend that you do. So how does that work on the operational side? So, um, I mean, that's actually a great question because um, so um, customers also like via the portal, like they, they also have an option to configure um, so on top of us being monitoring and manually um, initiating mitigations when a DDoS attack is, um, is observed, customers and the other portal have an option to create firewall rules. So, and that, that Oh, that can also help them add an extra protection layer. So at, at silver line border, let's call it. Um, so if they if they know the the type of traffic that they that they are expecting, then they can just block traffic that they don't want. So that will be like blocked at the very edge. And um, well, so th there is one, and we have actually like a set of rules that we recommend customers um, during the onboarding. We tell them, uh, well, if you don't expect this uh, traffic from this or this type of traffic, um, then um, we recommend you putting these firewall rules because, well, it's an additional uh, protection layer. So that's kind of like how we tell customers. Then um, also for layer seven attacks, which tends to be a bit more complicated, um, then we also work with the customer on um, identifying um, you know, uh, how many transactions per second we observe on their, um, um, on, on the proxy or the virtual IP that, that we're seeing. Um, so that from there, we can set, set up thresholds that when those thresholds are met or surpassed, then, um, then the, um, well, the, DDoS, the DDoS mitigation can take action as well. So uh, all this is like it's communicated with the customer, and like um, it's an ongoing uh, process between customers and the SOC. Like it's constant communication on like okay, because also like I think you mentioned earlier as well, when we get new customers, like they start sending us their traffic, but we don't really know what what traffic they expect, right? Like we mm -hmm. just see traffic, and there are times that they customers use specific applications with some ports that look weird to us. It's traffic that we haven't seen before. And well, in those cases, we have to work with the customer on like, hey, we're seeing this traffic. It looks weird to us. Is this something that you expect? And then, well, customers either confirm or deny, and then we take action based on uh, the, mm -hmm. com the conversation with the customer. But yeah, yeah it's, it's just like a two-way conversation, and it has to be like constant conversation for sure. Yeah. So you guys are locking arms and in the trenches together and it's, it's great, great relationship, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Pretty it's much. Gotta, it's gotta be, I mean, it's gotta be right for it to work. Yeah. Right. It's like you said, I mean, something may look strange to you initially at the sock, but then company X, you know, whatever they're like, no, 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 that strange stuff that you're seeing is strange. That's actually normal for us or whatever, or maybe mm -hmm. it's not, you know, but yeah. So that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, good stuff. I know you said another great. one. Yeah. Good deal. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's helpful. Uh, is Silverline only for DDoS or also for Layer Seven? So yeah, there's the 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 Layer Seven as you mentioned. You've got the firewall aspect and not just the the network that's traffic right. as well. That's right. Yeah. But SQL we, injection, man. Yeah, the injection attacks. That's yeah. the number one on the OWASP. Well, yeah, yeah, as you're, yeah, and as you're talking about, it, just <clears throat> for the, the larger audience that you're talking about, you know, the type of traffic you expect. If you're, for example, if if you have SQL Server with IIS running in front of it, 
then you can probably block everything that would be specifically Unix because none of that matches your profile. Is that the kind of right. stuff that you're talking? That, um, I mean, well, in in that case, like just going into injections and uh, well, those type of attacks, we have a different uh, service, which is the WAF managed service. It's also part of the Silverline fam family. Mm -hmm. So like, with the WAF also, it's a managed, a full managed service. And we can put uh, policies that will block and well, basically they will identify um, potential um, attack signatures and they will they will be blocked and then uh, also it's kind of like a similar process with uh, as with the ddos it's just um WAF, of course it, they they take a different approach it's a phase a uh, phase tune policy tuning on where um also working um hand 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 by hand with the customer side mm -hmm. like constant communication and we we can enable um different protections based on the application. And so yes, that that is also part of Silverline, but not necessarily part of the DDoS uh, service gotcha. per se. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So two two Silverline services independent, but we're mm -hmm. complementary to each other hand in hand. And, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And as, a cost, as a customer, you could use one of them or the other one, or you could use them both together. So yep. yeah, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. Well, hey, really quick, I know I know we're coming up on a little bit of time here. We don't want to take too much of your time, Edgar, but I did want to talk about one last thing in this uh, report, and that is the the types of attacks that we're actually seeing. Uh, there's a pretty good, there's a really cool chart that's in the report um, that will come out a little bit later, I think, in the coming uh, days or weeks. Uh, but it talks about across the last several months, so that we're talking about kind of this during this coronavirus crazy time. Um, there were a lot of different types of attack vectors that we saw, and we saw some spikes in different kinds. So it looks to me like the UDP protocol is really used a lot uh, by attackers to take advantage of these attacks. Uh, the TCP protocol obviously is used as well, but maybe talk to us about why do they why do they tend to use UDP? And then I think you mentioned a little bit earlier, TCP can actually be pretty devastating. Uh, even more so than some of these amplification attacks, maybe on UDP or whatever. Um, but maybe if you could give us a little bit of, uh, of, of a little thought on why UDP, but also to, how is TCP bad? Um, so, well, I, I think one one of the reasons UDP is, uh, is used the most, it's because it's a connectionless protocol. Mm -hmm. So basically you don't... Um, the sender doesn't have to uh, wait for confirmation from the receiver that the packet was received. It just blasts packets, and well, that makes it like an ideal weapon, right? Because you can just blast packets to your target. If they don't make it to the target, you don't care because you just what are blasting. <laughs> yep. It's like whatever. I don't care. Hopefully, yep. it made it. If I'm the attacker, it's like hopefully it made it. If I didn't, I'm gonna send yep. another one, right? Yep. Yeah. So, okay. so I I believe that's I mean that is the main reason like just like because of the protocol itself like allows and well and on top of that well there are like a lot of miscon misconfigured uh, devices out there that um you know like that they have like per se um LDAP protocol which is one of the um one of the vectors that we've seen and mm -hmm. as an amplification but one of the ones that we see often um. So all those servers, like of course, attackers um, find these uh, exploitable servers, and then they decide to well, if they are available and they are serving uh, requests out on the open internet, why not just use them as our reflector um, attack? Yeah. So that's basically um, how they do. Like I mean, it's just. It's just like the the vast amount of um, um, misconfigured um, devices out on the internet. So yeah, and I, I think and I've I've heard some people say you know like if you have an LDAP server that's misconfigured, it's maybe open to the internet, or a DNS server that's misconfigured, or you know an NTP server, the, the network time protocol, those can be used for reflection or amplification <laughs> attacks. Or there's any number. A, a lot of people have come back with questions. They're like. Why in the world is this DNS server open like that? Why is this NTP server open like that? Like who in the world set that up, right? 
Like, who yep. is this person? Let's go get him, man. Let's like say, hey, what are you doing? It was probably me. It was probably <laughs> Jason Rob. He already told us. He was he he like tried to correct the ISP backbones. He was a router jockey, yeah. the whole thing. No, but but it but none while, while you should not misconfigure these servers or these you know uh, services. The truth is, a lot of them are out there and they're misconfigured. Is that true? I mean, they're it's not like these are going away, right? No, I mean like. They are they are just out there and uh, well I honestly wish I knew like what are the admins thinking that they are not patching it or like is, is it really a uh, like is there a real need to yeah. to have those servers exposed to the internet you know like I mean yeah. organizations have their reasons or maybe just malpractices you know yeah yeah you know I I will say that you know I, I, there may be some. Uh, malicious reasons some of these things are left open but you know as as I get into more and more software development you're watching tutorials on how to build applications and all that there's an there's just so much information about the hello world type of of getting started stuff right um, but the next steps of okay you know how to do it now how do you do it well and then how do you do it well and how do you do it safely you know that's the part where it, it takes years sometimes to to build up that level of acumen and and it's the same way in the network world you know you've got um guys not you know very far into their career doing most of the 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 basic standard service type stuff mm -hmm. you know setting up routers setting up switches and often you know setting up dns falls into that that realm and there's it's pretty easy to set up all of those things it's not so easy to set them all up well. And I, I think that that's probably why a lot of those end up the way they do. Yeah. And not just that, it's so easy on the consumer side to uh, you know, stand up a, you know, one of those moon walls or uh, PF sense, you know, routers, and it's like set it and forget it. But you know, default settings aren't always, you know, that yeah. secure and that's safe. Right. And so um, yeah, many times they're not. Yeah, they're many not. times they're not. And then, and then also, in order for you to get it to work, uh, you end up instead of doing it the right way, you change defaults yeah. so that your stuff works. Yeah, you just you, and, maybe you open it wide open. It's like okay, yeah. now it works. I mean, I'll give <laughs> a perfect right. example. A perfect example from when I very first got started on Big IP with version four point two. Yes, you heard that right. I've been around that long. Dot two. Uh, oh. Four dot two. When you installed it on a Dell twenty six fifty server, it's like because a CD you can still put it on your own hardware, right? And uh, you know, in order to get all the routing working, because I didn't really understand about virtual servers and all that, you know, there was a little checkbox that said, you know, default route all. And so I just pretty much had a zero dot zero dot zero dot zero slash zero, so everything could route perfectly through the box, which completely killed all the default deny functionality of the system so that I could make it work. <laughs> Suddenly and, it's default allow everything yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And that totally yep. wasn't on a DOD system that should have been secure. No, but it was in a lab. It was in a lab. Um, yeah. So yeah. Full disclosure. Yeah. No, but you're right. I think that I think there's just the functionality of saying, hey, I gotta get this thing working. And sometimes you just open it wide open to do that. And then you never go back and shut it down or yeah. lock it down. Yep. Yeah. It's like so we've seen a lot of like, hey it's it's working now. Just leave it like that. Don't touch it. <laughs> it's working. <laughs> yeah, you will not touch that because it works. Yeah. Never yeah. mind. It's a it's a huge target for an amplification attack or a reflection attack for a UDP flood or whatever. But not. But do not touch it. Yeah. So well, at least we're, oper we're operating. operating. Yeah. To, yeah. to your point about don't touch it. Even things that were secure securely deployed at the time. Uh, may have been running for years, and so nobody wants to touch it. But vulnerabilities have been discovered, and right. nobody's tracking that. And yeah. so now they aren't secure because what was known at the time is, has right. changed. The world has kind of caught up to them yeah. and surpassed, and yeah, now they're not secure. Yeah. So yeah. So nonetheless, there's all of these open, you know, DNS resolvers or NTP servers or you know LDAP, LDAP. servers or whatever, right? And just attackers just hammer these things. Yeah. And use them as the launch point for these crazy DDoS attacks. Um, but yeah, so it's I, I don't know. I, I find it all fascinating. I'm I'm really curious about what's going to happen with uh, you know the, the when HTTP three really comes out and is adopted, and you know with the transition from TCP to UDP running on Quick. 
you know, what this chart's going to look like in, in a couple of years, you know, yeah. um, have all the smart people who are trying to prevent the kinds of attacks with these new protocols, you know, have, have they outsmarted the people who are going to be poking at them? And, uh, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm curious to see what it looks like once, once HTTP3 really takes off. Yeah, super cool, yeah. man. That's one thing I love about just this industry. I mean, computer, networking, security, all that kind of stuff, man. You cannot take a nap. You cannot blink. That's or you will cool. be obsolete like that. I mean, you yep. got to stay at the forefront, which frankly yep. is another plug for why you need a team like Edgar and the SOC guys, right. right? Who do this every single day. You know, if you have your own security team, and I'm sure I'm sure there are organizations that have amazing security teams, yep. but there's a lot that just can't, they can't handle that from a resource perspective or whatever. And man, how do you keep up with it all? I'll tell you how you keep up with it all. You talk to Edgar Ojeda and the SOC experts, yep. right, Edgar? That's right. That's correct. Beautiful. And, and one of the beautiful things that I'll, I'll just sing the praises of Silverline is that, you know, you guys are very much of the of the standpoint of, hey, if you're under attack, we'll help now. We'll figure out the contract later. And, and yeah. I, I, I love that. So, you yeah. know, if you if you are facing an attack, call into Silverline, you know, that they, they'll definitely be there to help. And, and uh, you know, yeah. we'll figure out the yes. figure out the legal particulars later. But we need to get you safe. Right. So that's awesome. Uh, and, real, and on real that, quick, oh, go ahead. Uh, on that note, actually, um, uh, just just I wanna um, bring it up. We actually have had a, a few customers that were onboarded on emergency because they were under a very strong BDoS attack, and mm -hmm. um, the, it, they they were onboarded on the routed mode, which is usually the one that takes the longest to provision because well, there are configurations that need to be done on routers and mm -hmm. a lot of changes. But um, well, with, uh, with one of our uh, customers under attack, we managed to have them up and running in two hours with wow. the originals established. And uh, and well, by the beginning of the hour two, we, the customer was again back opera operating. So like I love so in two hours, we can actually, we could get everything done like it could be even easier if it's a if it's via the proxy service because right. it's just yeah. a matter of a dns update but yeah. you know like, yeah like, i love it Super yeah that, that, it's amazing that that amount of flexibility i'm also yeah. impressed by that customer's uh, ability to have change windows that fast so <laughs> i guess you when know, you're under because attack. there's a lot of moving pieces right you guys yeah. have process customers have process and sometimes yeah. aligning those things can be challenging but it's amazing how outage seems to make that stuff move a little <laughs> faster right. Oh Just yeah, get it going. Get it going. Yeah, right, well, and I wish I can yeah. customers forget about change management. They just like, yep, we need to go back to being full hundred percent operational. So like, they're like, yep, we just bypass change management for now, and then we deal with that later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Anise had a, a follow up question uh, about the the WAF silver line. Uh, do they put the policy in learning mode? Um, you know, uh, and do you, they have different V server based on what type of backend servers uh, are back there, whether it's IS, Tomcat, or Apache? Um, yeah, it, uh, like the so when when you are trying to onboard an application onto WAF, and uh, the customer has to provide a um, questionnaire filled in with uh, where basically they can specify the um, the encoding, um, uh, well, the type of encoding they're using, what type of server they're using. Um, uh, the different like responses, response codes that they wanna allow or that they use on a normal basis. You know, like kind of have like a baseline, and with that one, we we put a, a WAF policy in transparent mode so that we can start just triggering on potential violations, mm -hmm. and um, and we work with the customer based on those violations on identifying false positives, start tuning the policy so that we start getting uh, less false positives. Once uh, the customers are on a good um, place where they are like, okay, I'm not seeing an elevated number of false positives, then, okay, can we now move on to blocking mode? So, and then again, we have like, uh, it's a four phase uh, approach. Um, so, okay, well now let's move on to um, uh, blocking phase one, uh, which has certain features. Um, or certain modules that are enabled, and and then again, it's monitored for quite some time. And we we make sure that there are no not that many uh, false positives being generated, and from there we start progressing uh, across the four uh, phases that the WAF policy goes through. 
Yeah, good, yeah, perfect. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense too. Just kind of that process of you don't want to just jump straight in and be like, all right, full on blocking the whole thing. It reminds me of the movie Spaceballs, which is a classic, and we need to get as many Spaceballs references as we can when they were about to jump to light speed. Now, I think it was Rick Moranis. He was like, no, no, light speed is too slow. We need to go straight to ludicrous speed. So you don't you don't go straight to ludicrous speed. You, uh, you kind of ease into it. We'll get there. We'll get there. But uh, yeah, yeah, I love that. I love that phased approach. So it just makes a lot of sense. Yeah. You know, so awesome. Well, good stuff, man. Well, Edgar, uh, I guess I would open it up to you to say, is there any other stuff? I mean, this, this report, this analysis has been amazing to see kind of the, the differences or the, the ramp up during coronavirus. We'll see. I don't know when coronavirus goes away, which I don't, who knows when that's going to be, right? And yep. when we all kind of start to transition back to in-person working and all that, or maybe do a lot of us stay at home? Do we start to see these trends kind of maintain? Or do they do they ease back or whatever, um, you know? But it's just it has been fascinating to see kind of the uptick in certain things uh, during coronavirus, during mm -hmm. people remotely working. So yep. anyway, so maybe with that, um, they I would I would just offer to you or any other any other insights or things that you might want to just let us know about with what you've seen during this coronavirus time. Um, another insight. Um, let me. Think about something real quick. Um, well, well, there is one more thing, and um, yeah. one one vector that that we also saw kind of like being used um, a lot in this, especially in the last four months, which is a DNS query flood, um, mm. also known as a um, uh, yeah. water water torture attack. The DNS water torture. <laughs> I love that. It, I, I think about just a little drip of water kind of hitting my head or something, mm -hmm. you know? That's kind of the idea. Like it's yeah. just a little bit uh, more than, a little bit more than just like the, the little drip. It's, yeah. more it's a DNS like, packet hitting my head, whatever. <laughs> and then, and then the DNS keeps receiving those uh, bogus requests um, that maybe are part of the domain, but the third or fourth level domains um, are like spoofed, randomly generated. So that, ta that takes a, um, some some processing power on the DNS server and eventually the DNS server crashes. So we are seeing, we saw a bit of a, an yeah. increase. Like I would say like uh, almost 800% compared to 2020. Like, wow. So wow. It was and a that, big, big increase. That's a huge increase. And that's where they randomize like the subdomain part of the, of the domain mm -hmm. name. Yeah. So like instead of F5, you know, F5.com, you may have like, devcentral.f5.com. You may have like login.f5.com. You may have like whatever, right? So those happy are those happypuppies.f5.com, <laughs> you know, ludicrousspeed.f5.com. <laughs> or they've um, gone to plaid.com. They, they've gone to plaid. Yeah, Leslie, love the, love the quote. That's amazing, man. Um, so yeah, so they, but then what attackers will do is they will randomize the subdomain. So instead of devcentral.f5.com, they'll say, abc123.f5.com, abc124.f5.com. And then the DNS server's like, hey, I don't know. I don't understand this thing. But they got to do all this searching through the records and all that, only to find out this is a non-existent domain, right? Like an NX domain. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that kind of the heart of what happens there? That's pretty much. That's pretty much. Okay. I mean, like, yeah. Yeah, since, since the requests come in the hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of packets per second. So now in a DNS server trying to process hundreds of thousands of non-existing requests. At some point, they, well, the server says like, yeah, I, ca I can keep up with all these requests. Like I'll just say nothing exists. Yeah. And yeah. DNS is down and it's like, it's like when my kid asked me to go find, you know, her hairbrush in the bathroom or whatever. And I'm like, Man, I've looked for three hours. I can't find this thing. And then she's like, oh, yeah, yeah, it was, it was at my friend's house. So never mind. I'm like, I just wasted three hours of my life. You know, it doesn't exist. Um, You're a better dad thing. than I am because I would well, not look for a hairbrush for I, three hours. Maybe I exaggerated that slightly, but to emphasize the point, right? So it's like these DNS servers are looking for something that doesn't even exist. They're like, come on, man, give us a break, you know? But yeah. uh, no, I love it. I love it. Yeah. Well, good stuff, man. This has been This has been fascinating, Edgar. Really, really good. Yeah. Yeah. Really good Thank stuff. You. Well, yeah, hey, yeah. A good time. Yeah. Well, I, we we have just been. It has been the uh, 
you know, the the pleasure has been all ours Absolutely. to have you on today and uh, and to learn about these trends, about these attacks, about how they happen, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so we will, uh, man, we'll continue to, you know, to do the great work, obviously there at the F5 SOC and, uh, and maybe talk about more of these in the future. You know, if we see some different trends or whatever, yeah. maybe we'll come back, you know? Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. As, as we start learning new trends and everything. Yeah, definitely. That would be right. something that we can share as well. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, good stuff. Well, Edgar, it has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us today on uh, Dev Central Connects. And, uh, and man, we would love to have you in the future if, if uh, time and effort and all that allows. So, uh, so thanks for everything you do there in the SOC every day. Yep, for sure. Thank you very much. Hey, take care, man. Awesome. Well, Mr. Edgar, man. Um, so yeah, we could probably move that uh, little thing there, but yeah, it's uh, it's good stuff, man. I guess to see the um, you know to see the different attack trends and know that uh, you know one thing one thing I was one thing that I thought about is I I uh, I'm sure this is the case. The SOC team goes in every single day, and they're going to see DDoS attacks every single day. You know that there's not a day that goes by that they're like, oh, we didn't see anything today, kind of a thing which kind of highlights the point that if you're an organization, then you are either, I, I like to think of it like this, you're either about to get attacked or you're in an attack or you've just come out of an attack or you may be in all of those at the same time. So, but that's, that's the world you live in. Like yeah. you're in one of those, you're in one of those phases, right? Yep. And that could be app to app, right? As you said, you could be in all three of those because you, not all of your infrastructure is attacked at any one time. You might right. have multiple apps that are just fine and other yep. apps that are being attacked. And, you yep. know, those apps get share pipe sometimes. Sometimes they don't share pipe. It depends on how your infrastructure is. But yeah, but yeah. Um, and, and wouldn't it be nice if you have um, Silverline uh, DDoS to be able to get an email like, oh, we're under attack. Yeah, and go oh, back to doing the important things you do. Yeah, let them so. let them handle all that stuff because they know they know what they're doing. That's awesome, man. Exactly. Well, you know, we're right up on time. We actually had some other stuff to talk about today. But, Always. But uh, that Always. was such an amazing conversation with Edgar. We'll we'll push that off to uh, our next show. Maybe the next time, yeah. Which is Which, two weeks from today. Yeah, right? two weeks from today. Dev Central Connects. Uh, one week from today, though, we were going to mention uh, there is the Black Hat uh, Conference. It happens every year in Las Vegas, sunny Las Vegas, in the middle of the desert. Why did they build a city in a desert? I don't know, but Vegas you know, Viva Las Vegas. Uh, but anyway, Black Hat always happens there. But this year, coronavirus, or speaking of coronavirus, is not happening. It's all virtual. But we are going to be bringing a Dev Central Connects live show to the Black Hat's uh, audience at our, what, what we'll call the F5 virtual booth there at Black Hat. And so you can join us a week from today. Uh, so next Thursday at 1230 Pacific, uh, and we will have some security experts on to talk about some different threat reports and uh, and different really cool stuff that's happening in the world of F5 security products. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, so Black Hat next Thursday. So make, make sure you tune in for that. And I'm excited about that because I've never had the privilege to go to Black Hat. So even if it's a tangential reach in yeah. to Black Hat, I'm excited about that. Well, it's as Black Hat as anybody's going to get this year. That's so true. it's as legit as you can possibly get in 2020, right? That's true. So And anyway. uh, Alex and uh, Sumitra, see your questions. Uh, we'll we'll get those offline and, and we'll get you some answers. Um, so yeah, um, and then maybe we'll we'll do some uh, discussions uh, specifically about shape. Yeah, uh, we'd love to have a discussion about shape here on Dev Central Connects in the future. So that's right. Uh, yeah. But we'll, we'll we'll get back to you on those. Yep. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I want and to say hit subscribe on our YouTube channel uh, if you want to uh, if you want to get notified about our Dev Central Connect show each week. So, yeah. uh, so that's another one. And not only Dev Central Connects, but when we release our light boards and yeah, all that all the good all the goodness that comes out of Dev Central, you know, YouTube and other other places. So that's right. Make sure you subscribe. Well, hey, Jason, it's been another great show, man. Uh, so thank thank you to all of you in the community that uh, allow us to connect with you every single time that we do this show. We love it. We love uh, to, to be there with you, walk beside you in this journey. And, uh, and you know, it's uh, the community would not be what it is without each and every one of you. So, so thanks for showing up and uh, we'll, we'll see you next time on Dev Central Connects. Yep. Take care, everyone.